Thank you so much to the Chicago Tribune, to its editor, Jerry Kern, and to the Chicago Humanities Festival for hosting this important and such a special occasion. I am so honored to be back in Chicago. Chicago figures so importantly in my own uh, personal narrative. It's here that I worked for so many years as a journalist, and it's here that I, uh, the work that I did here won the Pulitzer Prize. And also it was here that I had the joy of meeting one of the most extraordinary people I've ever known, and that is Ida Mae Brandon Gladney. She's with me here today, I know, and with all of us. It is so extraordinary to also be here on 12th Street, on Roosevelt Road, which was uh, the place where so many people, millions of people, uh, arrived on the Illinois Central, the city of New Orleans, and many thousands upon thousands of people had come up from Mississippi and from Arkansas, from Tennessee, in hopes for the search, really, for the warmth of other suns, and for them, the name of that sun was Chicago. They landed at the 12th Street Station, which was not far from here. This is truly hallowed ground, and it is so extraordinary and emotional for me to know that we are standing here. I worked on this book for 15 years because it was my, my sincere hope that there would be some way that we could find a way to elevate this important part of American history to its rightful place uh, in the history books. This was a migration that carried six million Americans from the Jim Crow South to all points north and west. And it was, in many respects, not just a, a move. This was, in some ways, a defection from a caste system which is almost unimaginable to us today. It's a caste system in which uh, it was actually against the law, against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. Merely play checkers. It's as if someone must have seen a black person and a white person doing this in some town square in Birmingham and felt that the entire foundation of Southern civilization was in peril and we cannot have this. <laughs> in courtrooms throughout the South, there was actually, believe it or not, a black Bible and a white Bible to swear to tell the truth on. And believe it or not, there were even, there were even schools for the blind, children who could not even see one another that were segregated so that they could not actually see the person or the group that they, that it was so imperative for this caste system to exist that they would be segregated even though they couldn't see one another. And so I wanted to, to make it come alive for people who, you know, it's not been that long ago, this migration began during World War I, uh, where uh, people who had been in the lowest caste in this country were actually recruited by the North in order to come, in order to work the steel mills and the factories and the foundries and the railroads that were wanting labor because Europe was at war and, and the, all of these businesses in the North were, were desperate for labor, so they went to the, the uh, lowest caste people, the, the, leap, the cheapest labor in the land. And when they got there, they began to recruit people to come north. These are people who'd wanted to come for a long time but had not known whether they'd be able to make a way for themselves. When, they, uh, when the people went from the north to the south to, to uh, gather these people to come north, it actually turned out that the south did not take kindly to this, cheap po to this poaching of their cheap labor, and they did everything they could to keep the people from leaving. They actually arrested people from the railroad platforms. They actually arrested people from their train seats. And when there were too many people to arrest, too many African Americans seeking to leave uh, the south, they would actually ra ra they would wave the train on through so that people who had been waiting for months and months and months and years perhaps, saving what little they ha had, uh, had to watch that train leave without them and then figure out how now will we get to freedom. I ended up wanting to tell this story through three amazing people. Three amazing people. One of them, of course, was Ida Mae Brandon Gladney, who was a sharecropper's wife with uh, this, um, the misfortune of having been terrible at picking cotton. You don't think about people being good or bad at it. But she was really bad at it. And she would tell you that she was really, really bad at it. And I loved her for that. <laughs> I also had the chance to, to meet an amazing individual, a Robert, Dr. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster, who had been a surgeon in the Army, but it turned out he couldn't practice surgery in his own hometown of Monroe, Louisiana, 
and he decided to set out on a perilous journey for a place called California. He'd never seen California, but he knew that that might be a place of freedom for him. And so he set out on a journey in his uh, 1949 Buick Roadmaster, and before you say a thing, he said, if you'd seen it, you would have wanted it too. <laughs> and I wanted to recreate that journey. I actually rented a Buick as he had. I had my parents in the car with me. They had been part of this great migration, and they were in the car with me as we were driving through the desert, driving through the mountains, and where the road got mean and perilous. He had not been able to stop. He had not been able to find a place that would rent him a room for the night. And so therefore, he had to push his way through without sleep, his hands beginning to lock on the steering wheel for the lack of sleep, his eyes growing weary and aching from the lack of sleep, and yet he had to push on and push on. I want to know what it was like. At a certain point during that drive, I began to veer from the road because I too wanted to experience what he had, and I pushed myself forward without sleep. And at a certain point when I veered from the road, my own parents began to get fearful for all of us, and they said, you must stop the car. And if you won't stop the car, let us out. <laughs> and so I had a mutiny on my hands, and we stopped in a place called Yuma, Arizona, where because it was no longer 1953, we had no trouble finding a place uh, to, uh, to, to rest for the night. And I actually felt even more empathy for him because he had not had that option. And it is my honor to know that the daughters of these two people are actually in the audience with us today. It's such an honor. <laughs> I'd like to just make sure that I uh, speak to the, the role of this migration. I know that we don't have a lot of time, and I know you have a lot of questions, but I want to just say that this is a migration that changed American culture as we know it, the 20th century as we know it, the cities north and south as we know them to be. Many, many people who we take for granted as icons of the 20th century simply would not have existed had there been no great migration. People such as Toni Morrison, whose parents migrated from Alabama to Ohio, had they not done that, she would not have had the opportunity to merely go into a library and take out a library book that was against the law for African Americans at the time that she would have been growing up. But because her parents had the forethought, the courage, and the strength and the wisdom to leave Alabama at the time that they did and raise their daughter in Lorraine, Ohio, she had the opportunity to go out and get library books and to be able to get a better education. And if you're going to become a Nobel laureate, it's good to get a book now and then. You know, it helps. <laughs> Such people as, as Lorraine Hansberry and The Raisin in the Sun, uh, August Wilson, whose entire cycle of plays were about the dislocation, the heartbreak, the, long, the, ho the homesickness, the longing for home, the, the, the uh, uh, tensions north and south between those who stayed and those who left. All of his work was in some ways about the Great Migration. So too was the great uh, 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 play, A Raisin in the Sun, which of course is set here in Chicago. Much of music as we know it would simply not not exist. Motown absolutely would not have existed. Barry Gordy, whose uh, who was parents were from Georgia, migrated to Detroit. He got to be a grown man, decided he wanted to go into music, didn't have the money to go out and recruit the, uh, the best talent all over the country. So what did he do? He looked around himself, and among the people he saw were the children of the Great Migration, first generation in the North. And he saw these three girls. One was Florence Ballard, another one was, was uh, Mary Wilson, and a third one, I think you might have an idea of who I'm speaking about. She was known as much for her personality as her voice, and we would not even know Diana Ross's name. Had there been no great migration, she wouldn't have existed. Her mother was from Alabama, father from West Virginia. They uh, left this, those states during different eras, different decades, met in Detroit, married, had her, and history and legend was made. Uh, he also heard about this Barry Gordy, this very large family in Gary, Indiana. Nine or 10 kids. We would not know Michael Jackson's name had there been no great migration because he wouldn't have even been born. His mother was from Alabama, father from uh, Arkansas. They met outside of Chicago, moved to Gary, had all the kids, and yet another legend was born. Jazz would simply not have existed had there been no great migration. Uh, Miles Davis, his parents migrated from Arkansas, cotton country, to Illinois, southern Illinois, where he had the opportunity, the luxury, of being able to spend the hours it would take in order to master his craft and uh, go on to become the legend that he did. Thelonious Monk, his parents migrated from North Carolina to Harlem when he was five years old, where he too got the luxury to uh, master his craft. A craft and a genius was within him, but would have gone dormant had his parents stayed in the tobacco country of North Carolina. And John Coltrane, 
John Coltrane migrated himself at the age of 16 to Philadelphia, where believe it or not, it was in Philadelphia that he got his first alto sax. And you wonder, where would jazz be had that man not gotten hold of an alto sax? Where would music be? And not just music for Americans. And all of the people I've mentioned, these are gifts not just to America, these are gifts to the world. Every single name that I've given, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of the people who would not have been possible had their parents not had the fortitude and the courage to do what they did. These are gifts to the world. These people are as well known and regarded and renowned in Paris and Tokyo as they are here in the United States. This story is an American story. Who among us knows or is de descended from someone who uh, was a, an Irish, a grandmother, a great grandmother from Ireland who crossed the Atlantic in steerage and came to this country not knowing what was in, what she might have, what was ahead for her. And she met and married a, a great grandfather from Lithuania or Latvia or Poland or Germany or Italy or also from perhaps Ireland who she might not have met otherwise and created whole new lineages here in the new world. This is an American story and a human and universal story of longing and fortitude that is in some ways the reason why and speaks to how all of us got to this place, on this soil, at this time, at this moment. We all owe a debt and a gratitude to the people who did this. There's an epigraph in the book, Among the Many, in which it says, I quote from the Old Testament, and I say, it says here, even the stork in the sky knows her appointed seasons, and the dove, the swift, and the thrush observe the time of their migration. In this great migration, it's as if the people realized there are too many of us concentrated in this one area. 90% of all African Americans were living in the South at the time this migration began. And by the end of it, half were living all over the rest of the country. It was a true, truly a relocation of an entire people. And this is what happens in a, in a migration. It's a beautiful, predictable outpouring of people in hope for something better. And when these people did this, they ultimately helped to reshape the country as we know it. It was as if they said, there are too many of us concentrated in this one place. Our work is devalued. Our very lives are devalued. Perhaps we will fare better elsewhere. And that is what someone in all of our backgrounds had to have said just for us to be here. I want to leave you with this moment. It is the moment of departure that had to have happened in all of our backgrounds just for us to be here today. This is the moment when a young person, because this is a young person's experience, the idea of migrating across an ocean, across a river, across a desert, across the mountains, is something that a young person does. And at that moment of departure, there are, there are two sides of any departure. That young person is, is standing on a, on a dock about to board a ship across an ocean. That young person is standing on a railroad platform about to set off for a place called, that they've never seen before, called Chicago or Cleveland or New York or Los Angeles or wherever it might be. Or they're loading up their car and, and, and preparing for a long distance drive across the country. And there with them are the people who raised them, their mother, their father, their grandparents, their aunt, their uncle, whoever it might have been. And that person cannot make the crossing with them. It is too late for them in some ways. And at that moment, neither side knows if they will ever see one another again. Think about that. They have no idea where they'll see each other again. The next time that this young person might hear from the person who raised them might be a telegram that says, your mother is very ill. You must come back quickly if you were to see her alive. Or your father has passed away. That is the magnitude of a single decision that can have so much of an impact. Remember, there was no Skype. There was no email. There were no cell phones. There was not even reliable long distance telephone service. And so this was a final break from all that they'd ever known, and there was no guarantee of what might lay ahead. But this was done not for themselves, it was done for their children and the unseen grandchildren, and the unseen great-grandchildren, which is where all of us come in. We all owe a debt to someone who did what the people in this book did. And I want to leave you with the words of Richard Wright. How can I not be in Chicago and not read this to you? He was a child of Mississippi who set forth for, in 1927, for a place he'd never seen called Chicago. And as he was preparing to leave, this was on his heart and on his mind, and he wrote this. I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil. 
to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps, just perhaps, to bloom. Thank you so much.